Question 61. Payment of dividends under U.S. GAAP is most likely classified as which of the following activities? So we've got operating activity, financing activity, or investing activity. I'll pull in this nice chart here that we have from the reading. Um, and we can see here um, that dividends paid under IFRS can be operating or financing, but we want to know GAAP, which is going to be included under financing. So we can go ahead and choose B here. And so the, uh, the kind of logical logic or reasoning behind dividends paid being financing, whereas we have um, dividends received, interest paid, and interest received all as operating. Those dividends paid are just returning capital to shareholders. They don't really have any function in the operation of the business. Um, whereas if we're receiving dividends, um, we're obviously investing in some type of security that's paying a dividend, so that's probably part of our operation of uh, making money. Same thing with interest received, we're probably investing in some type of securities paying interest, so that's part of our strategy of making money. And then interest paid, um, most similar to dividends paid, I guess, under these four, is going to be classified as operating just because those um, typically that debt that we're paying interest on is going to be used to fund the business and fund those operations. Whereas dividends paid out, um, it's purely just a return for our shareholders. So we'll stick with B, financing activity. Question 62. Leggy Chemicals had the following information in their income statement. We've got revenue, cost of goods sold, operating expenses, interest expense, and tax expense. Leggy's gross profit margin is closest to. Um, so we've got two decimals and then we've got a uh, big number here, 26 million. So gross profit margin is going to be a ratio or percentage. So we can go ahead and cross off C right away. If it was gross profit, um, then we would be looking for a number um, hopefully a big number like that. Um, but since we're looking at the margin, it's going to be, we know it's going to be a decimal or percentage. So let's pull in that gross profit margin formula here. So gross profit margin is going to be gross profit over revenue and gross profit can be broken down into revenue minus cost of goods sale, cost of goods sold. So it's just essentially what we're selling our uh, inventory for over what we paid for it. Um, so we'll just be taking, looking at these two numbers here and not paying attention to these three at the bottom. Um, so pulling that in, we've got our 38.5 million, subtract out the 12.3 million cost of goods sold. And then we divide that by the revenue again, gives us 0.6805, which we can see is answer B. Question 63. Through his son, who works at ACIA Corp., a stockbroker learns that ACIA is altering its accounting records. He decides to advise his clients to sell the stock of ACIA. Is this a violation of the code and standards or why? So we've got a no and two yeses um, for whether we're violating or not. So that'll be our first decision there. Um, so keys here are going to be through his son, who works at the company. Um, so his information source sounds like it could be insider information. So then the second part of material non-public information, which it sounds like this is non-public information, is whether it's material or not. Um, and material is defined by information that would be likely to move the stock price, basically. Um, so a stockbroker learns that they are altering the accounting records. Um, accounting fraud and manipulation is going to be a big no-no for any company. And this is going to be very negatively looked at. Um, so we can conclude that this is material information. Um, so first level decision, no, yes or no. We're, we can definitely say that he did violate the standards by going by uh, acting on, on this information. Um, so then we need to figure out why. So yes, it constitutes the use of material public information. Uh, that sounds like it could be our answer. 
or yes, it constitutes the use of material non-public information. If the information was not material, then it wouldn't be a violation. Um, so that one answer doesn't make sense. So we can uh, go with answer B. Question 64. John Richards, a market analyst, is working on a regression model to establish uh, stock valuations in the banking industry. Without even finishing his model, Richard sees a stock that seems to be undervalued and sends his recommendation to buy it. Which of the following standards has Richards violated? So we know we violated something, we just need to figure out what, um, based on the information that we're given. So A, standard 1B, independence and objectivity. There's really nothing in the question that's suggesting um, that Richards is has any conflicts of interest or reasons to be um, buying this stock that's undervalued and sending the recommendation. So we can go ahead and rule out independence of object in objectivity. B, uh, standard 3A, loyalty, prudence, and care. This is typically related to clients, and there's nothing that suggests he did anything um, to wrong clients or treat them poorly. Um, none of his clients necessarily acted on his recommendation to buy it, or maybe this was going to some investment committee since he's just an analyst. So um, likely no client impact here, so we can probably rule out B. Let's make, take a look at C, standard 5A, diligence and reasonable basis. This sounds correct, uh, mainly due to this sentence here, without even finishing his model. Um, he sends his recommendation, so with the model not finished and being able to uh, properly analyze or test it, we can conclude that he probably violated diligence and reasonable basis. Answer C. Question 65. Rob Harrington, a stockbroker, works for a large New York bank. His long-term friend and a stock trader at the same bank calls him one evening to ask him if there are any clients interested in stock PTLN. Since there are no policies or procedures to discourage employees from, share, from sharing information, Harrington should most likely. So if his friend is a stock trader and asks him um, if he has any clients interested in a stock, that means that the trader is likely trying to sell the stock. And so this could potentially be considered uh, material non-public information, depending on how much stock they're really trying to trade or sell, I guess. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at the answers here. So A, disclose the information. Um, that doesn't sound like too bad of an idea. It's never too bad. Uh, it's always okay. It's normally a uh, good idea to disclose as much information as possible especially when there's conflicts of interest. Um, but if this is considered material non-public information, then the information should not be told to anybody um, since they might potentially act on it. So I think we can go ahead and rule out A. B, advise regulators of the potential conflict of interest and seek legal counsel. Going straight to the regulators without um, handling it internally with the firm is probably a little too dramatic of a first step. So we can probably go ahead and rule out B. Let's make sure C makes sense. Advise his firm to develop firewalls to allow different departments to function independently. Um, this sounds like it's our answer since they're at two different department, departments within this bank. Firewalls are going to help prevent situations like this um, where folks within different departments aren't able to really share information as easily. So we'll go with C. Question 66. Josie Ann Feng, CFA, is a new fund manager charged with the management of 50 stocks. What should be her policy for proxy voting? So for proxy voting, generally, we need to consider voting if it's going to benefit um, investors. Beyond that, it's, there's, uh, we're also going to do some cost and benefit analysis to decide whether um, immaterial or routine votes are worthwhile. Um, but with that in mind, let's take a look at answer A, or all of our answers, I guess. A, the manager should never vote since the manager's votes don't always represent the client, uh, the client's opinions. Um, we're going to rule that out based on kind of what we just talked about. We, we will need to consider voting if it's going to benefit investors. And uh, if it's going to benefit investors, then it should represent our client's opinions. 
B, the manager has a responsibility to investors to vote the shares to the investor's benefit, but can skip routine votes that would require too much time on a cost-benefit basis. This sounds like it could be our answer um, based on what we just talked about before diving into the answers. We're going to want to vote prudently if it helps investors, but we don't want to um, spend too much time on things that aren't worthwhile. Uh, C, the manager is always responsible for voting but not disclosing the proxy voting policy to all clients since that's part of confidential information. That's not going to be correct either. We'll, we need to disclose our uh, voting policy to clients. So we'll go with B. Question 67, which of the following is most likely incorrect? Material public information may consist of discussions with management that may reveal information that isn't material but may give valuable clues. So it says right here, it's not material, which contradicts it being material. <laughs> so I think we can probably choose A as our answer. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at answer B and C to make sure these are correct. Firewall is a common term applied to the barriers created to prevent sensitive information from being disseminated between the firm's departments. This is the exact um, definition of a firewall. They're trying to keep information that could create, create conflicts of interest from getting from one department to another, or that might be confidential or inside information. C, a compliance program is incomplete if all it does is create awareness of the definition of insider trading and the fines and jail sentences to which the employee could be liable. The This is correct. Um, it's certainly incomplete if this is all it does. Compliance firms should provide some guidance and rules for the employees to follow so that they're ensuring that they're acting in line with the uh, firm's policies and the law. So we'll go with A. Question 68. Which of the following is most likely incorrect? A. Discriminating, discriminating against non-email clients violates the standard of fair dealing. This is correct. Um, clients, regardless of whether they use email or not, should be treated uh, fairly and objectively. So we can go ahead and rule out A, since this is a correct statement. B, given a new recommendation, the firm should not trade until all clients have a fair chance to receive the new recommendation. This is also correct and kind of falls under the same jurisdiction as answer A. Um, if we have non-email clients, for example, we should make sure we're reaching out to all of them via phone or other communication to make sure they get that new recommendation. Um, so we can probably rule out B here. Let's make sure C makes sense. A standard of fairness and loyalty to clients requires IPO distributions to the most important clients or the people providing the firm with the most revenue. Um, that is certainly an incorrect statement, so it'll be our correct answer. Um, clients need to be traded fairly and equally, um, and I think the proper rules state that IPO distributions um, are to be made available to everybody who's eligible and are distributed on a pro rata basis if it's oversubscribed. Um, certainly not prioritizing important clients or high revenue clients. So we go with answer C. Question 69. Marco Rubio is a CFA member working as an equity analyst at Bright Stock Brokers. After thorough analysis, he has concluded that the stock of M&M is overpriced at its current level. However, he is aware that his firm's investment division is in talks with M&M to underwrite a rights issue and is concerned that a negative research report might hurt the good relationship between the two entities and possibly scuttle the underwriting plans. Rubio needs to write his report right away. Which of the following outlines the best course of action, action for Mr. Rubio? Uh, so we've got A, write a report outlining his findings based solely on company fundamentals. This sounds like it could definitely be our answer. I'm going to go ahead and circle it, but we'll make sure we can rule out B and C. It's always going to be a good thing to um, write based on your findings without the uh, influence of outside conflicts of interest, whether it's your firm or um, personal conflicts. And he's um, done thorough analysis, so writing using the uh, company fundamentals is what he should be doing. 
B. Write a favorable report that excludes his findings but makes an effort to disclose them privately um, to the CEO of his firm. This is going to be dishonest um, and it's going to violate the standards of diligence and reasonable basis since he's making this uh, writing, making the favorable report without um, evidence to back it up since his evidence is saying he should write the opposite. And then C, write a report honestly outlining his findings, but only after consulting with a fellow CFA member who happens to be a minor shareholder at M&M. Um, consulting with others, particularly shareholders at the company he's writing the report about, is probably going to increase the chances of his independence and objectivity being clouded. Um, a shareholder at M&M is not going to want him to release an unfavorable report so they'd be um, biased towards swaying him to um, write a more favorable report. Uh, so we'll stick with answer A. Question 70. Which of the following parties can most likely claim compliance with GIPS? So we've got four um, different options here and then our answers are different combinations of these people. So the only way that we're able to claim compliance with GIPS is if we manage the assets ourselves and uh, basically have discretion over those assets to do what we please. So with that in mind, let's take a look at these four options here. So we've got plan sponsors. Um, plan sponsors do not manage the assets themselves. They're kind of just there to ensure that the retirement plan is administered properly and they're beholden to the participants in that sense, but they're not um, necessarily making investment decisions, so they can't complain. They can't uh, claim compliance. Um, so that leads us to rule out answer B then, since uh, one is on there. Two software developers. Um, software can help firms get to GIPS compliance that manage assets, but the software developers or software itself won't be able to complain. Claim. <laughs> It's a tongue twister. Won't be able to claim compliance um, since they're not managing the assets themselves. Um, three firms that do manage assets, so that's going to be a good one. That's what we're looking for. And then four consultants who do not manage assets. Um, this one's a little tricky because the consultants are investment consultants are generally advising on you know the different managers, um, a manager selection, asset allocation. But they don't have discretion typically, and they're not the ones managing the assets, so we can rule out four as well. And so for A, we've got party three or C, parties three and four. Since four is included there, we'll rule that out and go with A. Only firms that manage assets.